Friday night big meeting, and this is where I introduce the big speaker tonight. And please help me welcome our speaker, Mickey B. from Santa Monica, California. Everybody, my name's Mickey Bush and I'm a fully conceited alcoholic. <laughs> That's fully conceited, not fully conceited, although you may change your mind later on. <laughs> well, well, having a little gratitude attack here. Gratitude attack. Anybody know what I mean by gratitude attack? <laughs> I never knew nothing about gratitude when I got here. Grateful? What was there to be grateful for? Gratitude wasn't even in my vocabulary. And yet the truth of the matter was, I had something to be grateful for all my life. My name's Mickey Bush. Mickey Bush. <laughs> Think about that. Mickey Bush. That puts me somewhere between a mouse and a president. You know. <laughs> Anywhere in that spectrum is where you're likely to find me. Perhaps there ain't too big a gap, huh? But... Mickey Bush. I am really grateful they never named me Harry. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine going through life with a name like Harry Bush? Yeah. We're rotten la laughing at that, yeah. So I'm having a little gratitude attack right now. You know, I have gratitude attacks all the time these days. What a magnificent... What a magnificent event this is. i just uh, overwhelmed, overwhelmed by everything about it, the people and the, and the event. Just uh, really, really grateful. I just asked down there, how's, how's it going? I said, wow, I'm sure glad I don't get what I deserve. <laughs> Supposing we got what we deserved, we'd have a different ball game here, wouldn't we? Wow. Uh, Really glad for the purple lay. I'm glad for any lay, you know, my own purple. Uh, <laughs> I got love handles no one's grabbing, you know. Magnificent dinner, lovely food. Me and my inner child, thank you. Just, uh, just fabulous. Just really fabulous. I, I, I've, been, I've been here... Well, several times before, and uh, I've been to the conference four times. This is the fourth time, and magnificent, absolutely stunningly magnificent. You know. And so much, I, I couldn't help remembering that so much we used to miss. I used to miss when I was out there doing the wild thing, you know. And simple things I would miss. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous on January the 15th, 1983. Broke, busted, disgusted and not to be trusted. And uh, was missing everything, missing everything about life. Everything. And I, I, I got a, a little story and a little Hawaiian story that just puts that in perspective. When I come here the first time for the convention, the first time, I was six years sober. And I was here with a guy I sponsored, me and uh, French Froggy John. He was a guy from Paris. French Froggy John, we called him. He used to call me roast beef. 
Roast beef, because I'm English. I'm a limey lush and loady. This is the way I speak. Alcohol didn't do this to me, you know, I mean. <laughs> so French Froggy John and me, roast beef. We were so thrilled to be here. We'd never been here before. and We were just so thrilled. And the things that we would have missed if we were drinking and used to miss. We were walking along the beach, down there on, on the beach, and uh, I saw a little man, a little old man, playing a guitar, and he was just entertaining these little kids around him. He had half a dozen little kids, you know, I guess about three to eight years old, and these little kids were just thrilled to bit. looked like a grandpa or something, and these kids, and... I said, John, look, look at those kids, look at that old man, look, that's uh, it's such a lovely sight, look how pretty that is, look, isn't that magnificent? So I said hello to this old man, and I said, hi, how are you? And he said, hi, how are you? I said, I'm pretty good. I said, just thrilled to be here. He said, oh, he said, I can tell you're from London. I said, yeah, I'm from London. I said, he's from Paris. He said, uh, I've been to both those places. I said, Really? I said, I was just thrilled to bits to see you. It was just such a pretty sight to see you, you know, playing for these kids and that. Well, the kids were unbelievable. They'd never heard London accents and Paris accents and French and stuff like that. They were just bombarding us with questions and talk. And, and, and we just stayed there and we hung out. And we hung out there for a couple of hours. And this old man was great and... The kids were great and we were just having the greatest time, sober. And then all of a sudden, after a couple of hours, this old guy, he said, "Um, he said, can you look after the kids for a while? Keep your eye on the kids for a while. I've got to go to work. I said, what? (laughs) I said, what? Like like kids? Like look after kids? You've got to go to work? Yes, he said. Oh, wow. Oh, and where are you going to work? He said, just here, just here at the, uh, at the marquee. I said, what marquee? And I hadn't noticed. We were having such a, a time. I hadn't noticed that as this two hours was going by, they'd put up a marquee and there was, you know, banners and stuff going on and people and we hadn't noticed it. I said, where are you working? He said, over there. I said, what are you going to do? He said, uh, Oh, I'm just going to sing a couple of... It was Don Ho. (laughs) I never knew who he was, but... We had the greatest time. And if I'd been drinking, I would have missed it. Like I missed so much. You know, I've learned so much in Alcoholics Anonymous. January the 15th, 1983 was the first day. It's unbelievable to think think back and reminisce like this convention's brought to me. I didn't know nothing about nothing. I didn't know nothing about nice. I didn't know nothing about kind. I didn't know nothing about love. Anybody who showed you love or kindness or we just took that as weakness and just gobbled them up and hurt them and took what they had. But you guys taught me different. You taught me different in the ways that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. He taught me different with the examples and with a nudge here and a nudge there. And I, I got sort of took over after I'd been here a little while, just a couple of days or something. A guy, you know, we were walking along one day and he went, Tuesday night, we can go to the Tuesday night meeting and uh, wash the cups. I said, what? He said, the cups, they need washing on a Tuesday night. I said, there's 200 bloody cups. They didn't have styrofoam, they were mugs. They were these big hairy ass mugs, you know. And uh, I said, there's 200 mugs there. I said, like, wash the mugs? Yes, he said, they need washing after the meeting. I said, I don't want to wash the mugs. He said, well, go and get drunk. I said, I don't want to get drunk. He said, well, then we'll wash the mugs. Okay, so we washed the mugs Tuesday night. 
hour it took us after the meeting to wash these bloody mugs. 200 of the buggers. During the week, he said, don't forget Tuesday night we washed the mugs. I went, we washed the mugs last week. <laughs> well, he said, if they'll let us, we'll wash them, we'll wash them again this week. I said, I don't even wash my own mugs. He said, well, <laughs> go and get drunk. I said, I don't want to get drunk. He said, well, then come and wash the mugs. I said, shoot. So, like, 200 mugs later, I'm sitting on this sink and I'm, like, doing these mugs. Four months. Four months. I'm doing the bloody mugs. Tuesday night, 200 hairy ass mugs. Big. One night, I'm washing the mugs at the sink. And a guy came along and he stood at the end of the sink like that. I said, what do you want? He said, sponsor said, I've got to wash the mugs. I said, what mugs? He said, I suppose them mugs. I said, piss off and get your own mugs. (laughs) You ain't having my mugs, he's a mama. (laughs) I don't know about how to do that. I have no idea how to do this. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea about nothing. You know. I have no idea about the folks in Alcoholics Anonymous and alcoholics. How do I know? I don't know nothing. I get to Alcoholics Anonymous on January the 15th, 1983. I was so sick when I got here. I was so sick that I didn't know I was sick. Do you know how sick that is? Do you know how sick it is to be so sick that you don't know you're sick? That's really sick. (laughs) And if you're as sick as I was when I got here, so sick that you come into a room full of Alkies, a room full of Alkies like this one perhaps, good Alkies seems to me, and you scan the room, because where I came from you had to become a good scanner. You had to be able to walk in any situation and immediately scan the room. Even if it was just to see who was going to be the next victim. (laughs) And you scan the room and you think, well, I ain't as sick as him. Do you know how sick that is? Do you know how sick it is to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous thinking you ain't as sick as the next guy? (laughs) That's really sick. (laughs) So, So if you're in here tonight wondering whether you is or whether you isn't a real alcoholic or not, I want you to know that I can relate to being as sick as you don't think you are. You know? (laughs) Really sick. And I never knew. I never knew. I never knew nothing. I never knew nothing about nothing when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought I knew everything about everything. You know? You know, I thought I was God's gift to the universe. I know everything. You know, I, I know everything. They don't know, don't know nothing I don't know. I know everything. When my, when my butt's on a bar stool and I'm drinking, I can talk about anything. Don't matter what it is, I know about it. You want to know how the space shuttle blew up? I'll tell you. Because I know. Actually, I should have been on the space shuttle. I only miss being on it by that much. You know, I was busy at the time. I was, like, busy drinking, busy drinking. Alcoholics are very busy drinking, you know. You know, so, uh, you know, I don't know nothing about nothing. I don't know nothing about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know nothing about 12 steps or a program or, you know, a disease called alcoholism addiction. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing about nothing when I get here. You know, how would I? You know, I mean, we say things like it's a self-diagnosed disease. How could I do that? How can I self-diagnose a disease that I'm powerless over and tells me I ain't got it. How can I do that? I couldn't do that. I couldn't tell myself what I was. I couldn't self-diagnose this disease. That's why I needed you, you see. And I didn't know nothing. I never knew how to do anything like that. I didn't know nothing about nothing. I never knew I was alcoholic. I never knew I was alcoholic. How would I know? I mean, 
Where I come from in northwest London, everybody drinks. I didn't know anybody who didn't drink. I mean, everybody drank. We never had a reason to drink. We never had a reason not to drink. Everybody just drank. We drank if the team won, we drank if the team lost. If it was a tie, we drank till there was a result. We just drank. I don't know why we drank, we just drank. Everybody drank. You know? I came in here, you folk all know why you did it. I heard folk talking about why they drank. You know, they drank because they couldn't stand the pain, they drank because they was hiding behind who they was, they drank because they had all these issues. You know, like past the tissues, i got issues, you know. <laughs> and I thought, at what stage of the game do you discover that? I couldn't imagine that, me. I mean, I could never imagine going into any pub I ever drank at and saying to the bartender, oh, bartender, hit me with a triple shot of your best booze because I can't stand who I am and I want to cover up the pain tonight. <laughs> <laughs> never happened. Never happened. Oh, Mr. Dealer man, give me an extra rock of crack cocaine because I really feel inadequate. <laughs> Never happened. I have no idea. I have no idea why I drank. I have no idea. You guys did. I didn't. Always drank. Don't know why I drank. Just always had drank. I got three sisters and a brother my three sisters and a brother ain't alcoholic I'm alcoholic I'm alcoholic, my three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic they don't know why I drink I don't know why they don't (laughs) I asked them, why don't you drink? they said, I don't like it I said, what? (laughs) what don't you like about it? They say, I don't like the way it makes me feel. I say, what? <laughs> How does it make you feel? They say, well, if I have one too many, I feel sick. I say, sick? You've got to drink past that. <laughs> Who stops at sick? <laughs> I puke! But I don't stop drinking, for Christ's sake. <laughs> oh, that's handy, made room for some more. Yeah. <laughs> they don't laugh. They don't laugh, they think I'm weird. Any other weirdos in here tonight? Yeah, and the rest of you lying mothers, I know weirdos when I say. <laughs> Yeah, they don't laugh, they think I'm weird. All my life people said I'm weird. All my life people seem to think I'm weird. I don't know why. It never happened just because I got here. Years before I got here, they used to say, what's wrong with that kid? I'm a little kid, I'm just this big, I'm just a little kid. They say, what's wrong with that kid? He gets you in trouble, that kid. He don't hear shit right. And I'm just a little kid, I don't know. He's weird, that kid. Lock him up, put him away, put him in an arm somewhere. And I don't know, I'm a little kid. I don't know, I've got a hearing problem. I don't hear shit right. (laughs) People tell me things and I don't hear it. It doesn't collate the same as other people. People tell me stuff and I don't understand it. You know, it's... Well, I found out later here that what I was actually doing as a little kid was what later on it was going to prove to me what it was about me that made me alcoholic. And I didn't know. But when I was a little kid, what I was actually doing, little kids have survival techniques, you know. And where I came from was so devastatingly dysfunctional and painful that my, my survival technique as a little kid was people would tell me shit and I wouldn't like it so I would mentally change it to what I did like and then blame you for telling me. And they'd say, where does he get this from? What the hell's wrong with that kid? Lock him up, put him away. 
You know, and I don't know nothing. I'm just a little kid. It used to drive my mum nuts. Years later when I was like drinking and I would come home drunk, you know, lived in northwest London in my mum's house. My mum, like dynamic lady that she was, I mean, she, you couldn't get one over my mum in, in her house. I mean, she knew everything there was in that house. She knew every nook and cranny. You could not get one over my mum. And I would come home drunk, you know, typical alcoholic. You know, alcoholics, they have this insane belief that they know how to be quiet. <laughs> and I would come home all shit-faced and ripped and mum would be in her bed. She'd hear everything. I swear to God she slept with one eye on. And she'd yell out down the stairs, Drunk again, son! And I'd go, So am I, Mum. <laughs> you know? She'd say, I'm not bloody drunk. I've been in bed since 8 o'clock. What the hell's wrong with you, bloody weirdo? You know? And I wouldn't get it. And I'd think, Well, why did she say she was drunk then? Because <laughs> I don't hear shit right. I hadn't been in AA very long, you know, and I met one of them monsters that you eventually meet in AA. You know, those monster sponsors, you know. He said, get a job. I said, what? He said, get a job. I said, what? He said, get a job. I said, what do you mean? He went, go to work. I said, what? He said, get a job, go to work. I said, well, I don't know how I'd get there. He said, get a bus. I felt embarrassed because I'd never done a bus. I, you know, I'm smart, but I don't know how to get a bus. I, I've never ridden a bus. I was living up above Sunset in West Hollywood and I thought, I've got to be able to get a bus. So I walked down to Sunset. Buses are going up and down the boulevard full up with people. I thought, I've got to be able to get a bus. Buses are full of people. Stood at a bus stop. Bus pulled up and I jumped, hopped on the bus. Driver said, put some money in the trap. I went, oh yeah, okay, put some money in the trap. Stood there and waited for something to happen. And the bus pulled away. I went flying down the bus. (laughs) Fell up against this chick with these big ones. She said, move your hands. Well, I don't hear shit. I went, sure, sure. (laughs) Squeeze, squeeze. They threw me off the bus. It's not my fault. I don't hear shit right. (laughs) Kept locking me up, kept putting me away, kept incarcerating me and, you know, that's how I survived. I mean, I've been in and out of institutions most of my life. I've been incarcerated in in institutions, nut wards. I've been locked away in places cookers wouldn't fly over, man. (laughs) But they didn't know what was wrong with me. And they didn't know how to get it through to me if they did know what was wrong with me. They knew how to bash me up. They knew how to hurt me. They knew how to brutalise me. They knew how to chain me down in padded cells. They knew how to shoot me up with tranks and zap me on electric machines and all that kind of stuff but they didn't know what was wrong with me and they didn't know how to do anything about it even if they did know and even if they told me I didn't hear it but at that very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on January the 15th 1983 you guys and the magic that works in Alcoholics Anonymous if you be alcoholic of my kind our kind the beautiful book says this beautiful book here The magic in Alcoholics Anonymous worked on that very first day that I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, not knowing nothing about nothing. I never came here with the only requirement for membership. I never came here with any desire to quit drinking. I don't even know how you do that. You know, I read in this book, countless vain attempts to drink like other people. I don't even know how you do that. How do you try and drink like somebody else? 
I mean, what do you actually do to try and drink like somebody? I mean, do you sidle up next to somebody in a downtown bar and sit next to them and order what they're ordering and hold it the same way and drink it at the same... I mean, how do you actually try and drink like somebody else? I never ever tried to do that. I never wanted to drink like nobody else. I wanted to drink like me, like the pig I was. I didn't want to drink like no one else. We stood at the turning point. Half measures of ale in us, nothing. What? <laughs> I don't even know where the bloody point is. I never stood at no point. I don't know nothing about this. I have no idea about nothing like this. But when I approached that meeting on January the 15th, 1983, though I didn't know what had happened at the time, I do today. More has been revealed to me today and I know what it was. January 15th, 1983, something happened that hadn't happened at any other time up to and including that day. On January the 15th, 1983, something happened that hadn't happened before. Now, I've got to tell you, I've, I've been in a lot worse situations than January the 15th, 1983. I'd been in a lot more devastating situations and a lot worse of situations than that day. But what had happened on that day hadn't happened before. On January the 15th, 1983, I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you that I'd been physically clean and sober many, many times in my life. There is a total difference between sober and sobriety. I know our literature and Bill Wilson talk about sobriety, 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 but what they're really referencing is sober. And there's a total difference between sober and sobriety. I know that from first-hand experience. I had been physically sober many, many times. Every time I got released from an institution... Whatever kind of institution it was, whether it was maximum security, whether it was a nut ward for the criminally insane, whether it was minimum security, whether it was a hospital, a detox, whatever, it, whatever the institution was, I came out of there as physically clean and sober as I stand before you tonight. I've been physically clean and sober many, many times. Didn't have any sobriety. I see a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that are physically sober. Don't have any sobriety. We haven't got a, a sober program. We've got a recovery program. And the recovery comes from the program in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. There's two Alcoholics Anonymouses, you know. There's the meetings Alcoholics Anonymous that has the fellowship in it. And there's the big, big book Alcoholics Anonymous that has the program of recovery in it. This beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous as a program of recovery. Of course, I don't know nothing about this on January the 15th, 1983. But I tell you, are there any blackout drinkers here? Yeah. Any miracle drinkers? I can't see. Any miracle drinkers? No miracle drinkers? This is a disease of denial, you know. <laughs> D-E-N-I-A-L. Don't even notice I am lying. Or don't even notice it's a lie. I don't notice when I'm lying and I don't notice when I'm being lied to, especially by a disease that tells me I ain't got it. Denial. See, I'm a blackout drinker. I'm a miracle drinker. No hands went up, but I'll see how many uh, people follow up with what I'm about to say. Anybody go out drinking and have a miracle develop in front of their very eyes? You're looking at me as if I've got two heads. <laughs> Anybody ever go out drinking and drink somebody good looking? <laughs> Nobody ever go out and some old wretch turns into the delight of your life. <laughs> or certainly for the night anyway, you know. 
you know. Sometimes you wake up next to it, don't you? I've woke up next to it. One time I woke up next to it and I went, Oh! Oh! Get out! Get out! Get out! Ugly! Get out! She said, you get out, this is my house. <laughs> Kick my house out, you know. I don't know, I don't know, this is happening in all my life. I'm a blackout drink. I didn't even know what a blackout was. I've been having blackouts all my life, never knew what they was, till January the 15th, 1983. You know, I mean, I, I black out. I don't know how much to go into a blackout. I don't know how much to drink not to go into a blackout. I don't know how much to drink to go into a big one, a small one, a thin one, a fat one. I just know and fully conceded to the fact that when I drink, I black out. Didn't even know what a blackout was. I came out of a blackout once walking down the street in Spain. I went out drinking in London. <laughs> you know something's happened when you come out of a blackout and it's sunny and sunshine and palm trees. Ain't no bloody palm trees and sunshine in foggy, wet, rainy London. And I'm walking down the street and I've got an Eskimo chick with me. I don't know where she came from. But don't we find them? We find them, don't we? I mean, it never stopped. Oh, hello, Spain. Straight into a bar, carried on drinking. I mean, it never made any difference. I got released from a maximum security prison sentence. I'd been serving an 18-month prison sentence. My best buddy had gotten two years. He got six months longer than me because it, it, it was my first adult prison sentence, 21 years old. He'd already had a prison sentence, so he got six months longer than me. So he got out four months after me. I got released from this maximum security prison sentence. We'd got it for hijacking a truckload of booze. Every bit of trouble I've ever been in, Booth was in there somewhere. I got released as physically clean and sober as I stand before you right now. Six weeks later, I came out of a blackout I'm in chains in front of a judge on a murder trial, a murder charge, and I've killed a man and I don't even know what I've done. That's where drinking takes me. I don't go out drinking and have little slippy poos. I go out drinking and come out of blackouts in chains in front of judges on murder charges. You know, something remarkable happened on that trial. You know, we perjured and lied and cheated the whole thing and natural, I didn't know anybody who went to court and told the truth, including the cops, you know. But the prosecution today would have convicted my butt. But then they tried a, they tried a, a prosecution that was too advanced for its years at that time. But when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, what they tried made complete sense. What they tried to say in that prosecution was that based on my criminal history and based on my previous convictions and my previous trouble, when I went out drinking, it was predictable that something bad was going to happen. Here was my track record, and every time I'd been drinking and alcohol was in booze, something bad happened. So when I went out drinking, it was predictable that something bad was going to happen. So when I went out drinking and something bad did happen, they considered that a premeditated act. Murder one. And that's what they proceeded with. Murder one. And in England then, they hadn't passed the no hanging bill. So they used to sentence you to hang. I can remember the prosecuting counsel addressing the jury in the summing up. And I remember him pointing like that. He said, members of the jury, he said, on behalf of our Sovereign Lady the Queen, the people of the British Isles, 
the British Empire and the Commonwealth of Nations. We demand that you sentence this man to hang from the neck until dead, the ultimate penalty. I remember looking at that guy and going, you rotten bastard. (laughs) I mean, that's a lot of people. For the Commonwealth of Nations, they wanted my ass dead. For the Commonwealth of Nations. I went, wow. It kind of helps me today, really, when I think back, because, you know, when one of you get pissed off at me, I've been pissed off at by nations, man. (laughs) So it helps me today. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned what your definition of insanity was. I'd been, I'm certified insane in four different countries. But they never once said to me, we're locking you up for repeating the same behaviour and expecting a different result. They never said that. You guys said that. You guys said that the definition of insanity was repeating the same behaviour and expecting a different result. Drinking. I went, wow, wow. That went to the top with me. Wow. Nothing had ever got through to me prior to that. And in that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, a guy got up in my face And contrary to what a lot of people think the book says, the book don't say we don't tell folk they're alcoholic, it says we prefer not to. But when Bill and Bob were doing the third man on the bed, they got up in his face and said, you're an alcoholic. He says in the book, I didn't think much of that, he said, I figured I was a drunk. They said, no, you're alcoholic, we've got something wrong with us. They told him he was alcoholic, and you did with me. On that very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd come off a three-day run, I'd come off a three-day blackout and, you know, I, I talked to a couple of friends on the phone and they, they told me of some of the things I'd got up to over that weekend and that's a, that's a story for another day. I sat down at my coffee table in this little, a little flat I had in West Hollywood you know West Hollywood. Anybody here know West Hollywood? It's a very special part of town. A couple of folks know it. It's commonly referred to as Boys Town. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the kind of town where if you drop your wallet on Santa Monica Boulevard, you've got to kick it up to sunset before you can pick it up, you know? <laughs> nothing to do with nothing. It's just a place to live. If you're gay, don't be offended. No one cares. But I'm in my little flat and I sit at my coffee table and on the coffee table is a third edition big book with a meeting directory on it. You guys have given it to my roommate, the the girl I rented out the bedroom to in my one bedroom apartment. (laughs) And her rent paid the rent for the whole place and I had a mattress in a closet just off off of the lounge. You know, when you come out of a closet in West Hollywood it takes on a new meaning, you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but she'd been busted on a 502 and, you, and, and uh, you guys had given her this book and this. She wasn't an alcoholic addict. She just made a mistake one night and got a nudge from the judge and came here. You guys gave her a book and a meeting directory. She didn't need it. She left it on the coffee table. But when I needed it, they say when the pupil's ready, the master appears. There it was on my coffee table and I picked it up and I flicked through this meeting directory and there was a meeting that I could walk to just down the road on San Vicente Hill in West Hollywood. Architects of Adversity meeting. So I had to get out of the house. My skin didn't fit. I was, you know, detoxing, hurting and I had to get out. And I walk off down to this meeting As I walk up to that meeting, they tell me I was grey, shaky and smelly. One person said later that I I reminded them of one of those characters out of the bars in Star Wars. Do you remember that bar in Star Wars and, and those weirdos? And as I, as I approach that meeting, 
I don't know nothing about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know nothing about AA. I don't know nothing about 12 steps or being sober or the disease of alcoholism addiction. I don't know nothing about nothing. I don't know nothing about a home group. I don't know nothing about guys taking commitments, doing, participating in their own recovery. I know nothing about nothing. As I approach that meeting, a guy steps forward with his hand out like that. I said, what do you want? He said, I want to welcome you to AA. I said, what? He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what? <laughs> and the other guy stepped forward. He went, keep coming back. I thought he said, keep coming on my back. I said, what? <laughs> he said, keep coming back. I said, what for? He said, we love you. I said, I bet you do. When dudes tell you they love you and wear solid, would you get a bit nervous? I snuck round them and walked to the community centre there and stood in the doorway. And in this doorway was this meeting. I don't know nothing about meetings. They smoked in meetings and the room was full of smoke. There was 20 or 30 people in the room. Every one of them was talking. There were one person listening. They were all talking. I went, whoa, whoa, what is this? And down the centre came this English rock and roll singer. There were some celebrities in the room I already knew. And I, down the centre came this English rock and roll singer I'd known for a long time. He walked up to me and he put his arms around me. I went, what are you doing? He went, giving you a hug. I went, get away from me, you goddamn pervert. Get away from me. I said, what are you doing here? You're goddamn mental, you are. He said, I'm leading the meeting. I said, how come? He said, I'm 22 months sober. I wasn't impressed. I can remember taking half a step back. I went, oh, I didn't want to catch that. Whatever that was. <laughs> 22 months sober. He said, I'll speak to you at the break. We've been saving you a seat. I said, what for? He said, talk to these guys. I said, I don't want to talk to no dudes. He said, that's what we do here. I said, well, screw you. But these two dudes wouldn't shut up. <laughs> they had a wet one and they welcomed a newcomer. Like we welcome you if you're new. They wouldn't shut up. They had their nose in my ear. Talk, talk, talk. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Me too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All of a sudden, one of them said, You're an alcoholic. I said, What? He said, you're an alcoholic. I said, what? You, he said, you're an alcoholic. I said, that's a bloody mean thing to say to somebody, that is. <laughs> say a thing like that to a dude. What do you mean? You're an alcoholic. I said, why would you say that? He said, because if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and smells like a duck, it's a bloody duck. <laughs> Just because he's been taking some shit and thinks he's an eagle... No, you're a duck. <laughs> you're a duck, I'm a duck. Quack, quack, he went. I went, wow, holy shit. What is this? This is the bloody funny farm, man. <laughs> Guys loving on you and shit and ducks and eagles and shit like that. But I didn't know that he was planting the seed for me to understand what it was about me that made me alcoholic. Because I didn't know. I do, of course, know today. But a lot of you don't. How do I know that? Because I asked. I asked a lady here yesterday, long, long time sober, what was it about you that made you alcoholic? She didn't know. She thought she did. But she didn't. She knew what she did because she drank. She knew the consequences and the results of being alcoholic. She could say she was an alcoholic, but she didn't know what it was about her that made her alcoholic. And a lot of folks don't. That's why I talk about it. I didn't. I didn't know what it was about me that made me alcoholic. 
I could admit that I was alcoholic. I could tell you what I did because I was alcoholic. I could suffer the consequences of being alcoholic, but I didn't know what it was about me that made me alcoholic. I do today. The duck and the eagle story planted the seed. Didn't know it at the time, of course. You know, my three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic. I'm alcoholic. Same blood, same family, same environment, same everything. I am, they ain't. They ain't alcoholic, I am alcoholic. Well, my three sisters and brother got two kids apiece. Well, I got two kids. Ain't never been married, never had a wife of my own. But I, I, you know, I... Yeah, I got two kids. I'm alcoholic, my kids ain't. My three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic, their kids are. That's what we're dealing with here, folks. And I never knew what it was about me that made me alcoholic. But the duck and the eagle story planted the seed. See, what it is about me that makes me alcoholic... And why I identified as a fully conceded alcoholic, because in the beautiful book Alcoholics Anonymous, it says on page 30, anybody read this book, by the way? (laughs) It's a good idea. It's a good idea if you're alcoholic, read the book. On page 30, it says, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. Wow. That meant there was two first steps in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Two first steps. Damn, it was bad enough when there was just one. Now Mickey Bush is saying there's two. That's squeaky bum time, isn't it? Yeah. The first step in recovery is to learn to fully concede to your innermost self that you're alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. Now, how can I fully concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic if I don't even know what it is about me that makes me alcoholic? In one of my houses down there in San Fernando Valley, I got two parrots in a cage, a blue one and a green one. Bill and Bob is their name. And you can stand next to the cage and all of a sudden they go, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic. Powerless, powerless. They're bloody parrots is what they are. But they could say they were alcoholic and powerless. And I didn't want to be a parrot walking around here, you know, talking out the the side of my neck, you know, jive-ass crap that I didn't understand. So I wanted to know what it was. We learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. Not the first of the 12 steps. The first of the 12 steps is a totally different step where we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, our lives have become unmanageable and a lot of people don't understand that. I've spoken to many, many people about powerlessness and one particular person said... I'd never, ever thought of it along those lines. See, the two first steps are totally different steps, so I had to learn what it was about me that made me alcoholic so that I could fully concede to my innermost self. And fully conceding is totally different to admitting, accepting and surrendering. Now, admitting, accepting and surrendering is not mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Admitted in the first step, but admittance, acceptance and surrender ain't mentioned. But people talk about that all the time as if it's part of the programme, and it ain't. And because they're talking about admittance, acceptance and surrender, they ain't talking about what is in the programme, which is learning to fully concede to your innermost self that you are. So they don't. One of the reasons I think that we have such a huge failure rate in Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a huge failure rate. Don't worry, it works, Alcoholics Anonymous. You're looking at living proof of that. But we have a huge failure rate in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think some of these basic, simple principles are what what enables a, a a large percentage of us to fail. Because they never understand. What it is about me that makes me alcoholic isn't what I do because I'm alcoholic. Isn't alcoholic addictive behaviour? Isn't alcoholic addictive consequences? What makes me alcoholic is what separates me from my three sisters and brother. 
and uh, normal people. Now, what it is about me that makes me alcoholic is that I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And what that abnormal reaction to alcohol is, is what separates me from being an alcoholic from nine-tenths of the rest of the world, including my three sisters and brother. See, what it is about me and makes me alcoholic is that alcohol changes my perception of reality. Now, every one of you knew that. Every one of you, if I'd asked, would have said that. Alcohol changes my perception of reality. Alcohol changes me from a duck to an eagle. I go out drinking as a delicate little duck, have a few stiff ones and turn into an eagle and go swooping around looking for prey. That's P-R-A-Y. No, no it ain't. Alcohol changes my perception of reality. That's what alcohol does for the alcoholic that it don't do for the normal person, though we think it does. We think it does for everybody what it does for us, and it don't. Even if my three sisters and brother go out and have a drink or maybe even get drunk once in a while, it don't change their perception of reality. Come Monday morning, they take their kids to the school, they pay their bills, take care of their responsibilities. Not me, I go to Tijuana, for Christ's sake. (laughs) Alcohol changes my perception of reality. Why? Because I don't like reality, I hate reality, I don't want nothing to do with reality. That's why I wrote the word sober, S-O-B-E-R, son of a bitch, everything's real. (laughs) I don't like real. I call it a nerd remover. Alcohol removes the nerdness. I feel like a nerd, I drink, and I don't feel like a nerd. I feel like a nerd, and I drink, and I don't care if I'm a nerd. I feel like a nerd, and I drink, and you're a goddamn nerd. Screw you. Anybody know what I mean? Yeah. Mary in my home group down there in Santa Monica, she's a delicate little dudette. Bad ass, drunk is Mary. She says when she drinks, she feels wittier, prettier and tittier. <laughs> and I know exactly what she means. <laughs> Alcohol changes my perception of reality. That's what makes me alcoholic. Now, all the rest is true, of course, and without that it don't count. But that's the difference. Other people don't seem to understand that. They can all tell you what they do, they can all admit it, and they can all tell you the consequences. But understand that? We learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. Because on page 20 it says, if you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? And if a newcomer asks a guy like me, I'll tell him, you've got to do the 12 steps. Starting with step one. So admitting I'm alcoholic is not step one. Though many think it is. I heard somebody yesterday say, a newcomer did the first step as soon as he walked through the door, raised his hand as an alcoholic. It's not true. Not true. Two totally different steps, though often confused. Well-meaning people, at least I hope they're well-meaning, often confuse them. We've got to to straighten out some of this stuff. I didn't know. It goes on to say, the delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. Nothing about the ego smashing. The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. So we had to do it and it has to be done. There is nothing suggestive there, my friends. All this crap about suggestions only. If you can find anywhere in the program or literature where it's only suggested we do the steps, bring it to me, show me. I don't know where it is. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. What did that mean? Didn't have a clue. Never knew. Never had a clue. But I learned. I learned here. You guys taught me. 
But backing up a little bit, on January the 15th, 1983, something happened that hadn't happened before. And something happened that hadn't happened before that isn't mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, I told you, alcohol changes my perception of reality. That's why for many, many years, drinking and drugging was great. It was great. Now, I hear a lot of you say that you wouldn't swap your worst day sober for your best day drinking. I think, I don't know where you drink. I had great times for a long time drinking around the world a couple of times. You know? Until January the 15th, 1983, when alcohol stopped working. Alcohol stopped working. Oh, it didn't stop getting me drunk, and it didn't stop rotting my liver, and it didn't stop getting me locked up in clink, but it stopped changing my perception of reality. And here I am, I can't stop from doing it, I'm addicted to doing it, I've got a twofold disease, an obsession of the mind, allergy of the body. The obsession of the mind sucks me in, takes away my ability to say no, so that I've only got two choices, yes or no. The obsession of the mind takes away my ability to say no, so that then I have to say yes, so that when I do say yes, I think I chose to or wanted to, but didn't. The obsession makes me do it. Once I do the first one, it sets off what we call a phenomenon of craving. A craving is a feeling beyond my mental control. So I can't stop from doing it, and once I'm doing it, I can't stop doing it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no shit. I got a disease that is so powerful, it makes me do what I already don't want to do. When I absolutely don't want to do it, when every fibre of my body is against doing it, when every desire I've got in the world is to not do it, I do it anyway. Why? Because I've got a disease that I'm powerless over that makes me do what I already don't want to do. So I've got to not want to do it, but I can't rely on not wanting to do it. I've got to not want to do it, then do these steps and this work so that I don't do what I already don't want to do. And if I don't do these steps in this work or ain't done these steps in this work, I will do what I don't want to do because the disease I got that I'm powerless over will make me do what I don't want to do. You think I knew that shit when I got here? Never had a clue. Never had a clue. Powerless. I don't know nothing about powerless. Where I come from, you couldn't admit to being powerless over nothing. If I'd admitted to being powerless over anything, they'd have changed my name from Mickey to Michelle or something, you know. Powerless? What do you mean, powerless? What's powerless? I don't know what powerless means. I have no idea what I'm powerless. And guess what? A lot of you troops don't either. How do I know that? Because I ask. That's how. I ask. I've been asking this weekend. You'd be amazed. Be amazed. See, powerless isn't what I do because I'm powerless. Powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless over alcohol. Not people, places and things. Being powerless over people, places and things has nothing to do with nothing. It has nothing to do with alcoholism and it's not even true. Because, you know, a good alcoholic addict like me, you know, we do have some power sometimes over some things. So to say that I'm powerless over everything ain't true either. Because I do have some power sometimes over some things. If I consider that I'm going to use that definition of powerlessness and compare it to the powerlessness that I have to succumb to over alcohol, I'm screwed. Because until I fully concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic and admit my powerlessness in and of myself, if I leave even the slightest hint of a possible power, this disease has got a whole computer bank of evidence come barging through any gap I leave it. People, places and things, nothing to do with nothing. Everybody is and isn't powerless over people, places and things, nothing to do with alcoholism. And it ain't true. So I don't know why we keep saying it saying it because we don't know nothing else. I call it the lip-flapping party line bullshit that you hear in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh-huh. So a lot of that kind of stuff goes on. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Powerless. 
What did it mean to be powerless over alcohol? I didn't know what powerless over alcohol was. But I learned. We, see that we read in this beautiful book, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Cunning, baffling and powerful. This disease is cunning, baffling and powerful. It goes on to say, without help, it is too much for us. Help, H-E-L-P, his ever-loving presence. Without help, it's too much for us. But there is one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. Well, if i got to find him, it means I ain't got him. And if he's the source and he's the power over everything, and our book says he either is or he isn't, if God is the source and God is the power over everything, and I'm powerless over alcohol, it was quite easy to work out. The very word powerless ought to give you a clue. Powerless. Powerless equals no power. God equals power. Therefore, powerless equals godless. When I get here, whatever definition you want to use of God, I don't have it when I get here. I certainly don't have it over alcohol and I'm in the I'm in the depths of the darkness of a disease called alcoholism that's got me by the short ones and just sucks me in and makes me do what it wants me to do, which is drink. I'm in the grips of a powerful disease. Now, there's one who has all power, that one is God. Well, wait a minute, the disease is cunning, baffling and powerful. Does that mean that God's got all the power except the power that the disease has got? Didn't make sense, that. So my earlier teachings was able to define that the, the disease of alcoholism was powerful. That was like the, the equivalent of the devil. And God was the positive power. And I needed a positive power to combat the power of the disease that I was in the grips of and under the spell of and in and of myself was helpless, hopeless and powerless to resist its demand and had to do what it wanted me to do, which was drink. And I had no power to combat the power of the disease. Powerless, godless. And I never knew I was godless because the disease had gotten me way before I got here to abandon God and spirituality so that along the path of life, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, the disease became the power in my life, dictating and dominating me and making me do what I didn't want to do. And I had no God in my life to turn to to combat the power of the disease. I didn't know that. I didn't know that this disease, potential alcoholic, what I was, was already working in my life way, way back in the earlier days of my drinking. I was raised a Catholic. My dad's a member of the CIA, Catholic Ar- Irish alcoholic. You know that. <laughs> I'm not a Catholic basher. I don't want you to believe that. My beautiful book says it, AA's made me a better Catholic. But it didn't work for me. I hated it. I detested it. I was forced to go and I was forced to do it I, I remembered a situation. <laughs> I haven't come here to offend anybody, but sometimes I do. <laughs> when I was just a kid, 10 or 11, my dad f- whacked me and told me I had to go to confession. So I had to go in this confessional, and you have to go in this little dark cubby hole with a curtain, and there's some faggot behind it, you know, and, <laughs> and pray, and I'm scared, and I'm frightened, and, you know, and. And I'm just hurting and I, I thought, I know how I get, get, get back at them. So I took a dump in the confessional, didn't I? <laughs> Left a big one right in the confessional, didn't I? Big, big parish, Catholics, every hour on the hour, Sunday, f- f- church was full up, parish priest. He was like an icon, he was like a, a f- saint. Wasn't very f- saintly this day. Sunday, his veins are popping and he's, he's, ooh, crept in the confessional. The whole parish is, oh, oh my God, upset the parish priest. Somebody's shit in the confessional. <laughs> There's sneaky little bastard me laughing up my sleeve. <laughs> the next week I went prepared, didn't I? I went in the other side, left the note, said, the phantom shitter strikes again. <laughs> I 
don't know that I'm already in the grips of a disease that's like about to get me to, you know, to abandon God and spirituality so that I have none in my life when I get to Alcoholics Anonymous? Powerless. I'm powerless over alcohol. I've no God in my life when it comes to alcohol. I've got the gift of desperation. G-O-D, gift of desperation. I had the gift of desperation. And I met you guys. You plus me was a power greater than me. You, me plus you was a power greater than you. Together we could do what I couldn't do alone. I couldn't stay sober. You couldn't stay sober. But together we could stay sober. But I hadn't had it on January the 15th, 1983. On January the 15th, 1983, alcohol stopped working. I don't know nothing about nothing and I'm full of hurt and hate. I don't know what you brought to Alcoholics Anonymous, but what I brought here was a lot of hurt and hate. Hurt and hate. Hurt and hate. I hurt and I hate everything I hate and I hurt and alcohol isn't changing my perception of reality and giving me a buffer between you and this rotten world and you rotten people doing rotten shit and I hurt and I hate I hate everything I hate women I hate women, I can't stand women I hate homos and queers and anybody different I hate black people I'm totally racist and prejudiced I'm from London, England, living in Los Angeles, and I hate foreigners. <laughs> I can't stand me. I hate you and get away from me and don't come near me. And with all that torment and turmoil going on inside, I still have to try and present to you a picture of somebody you will like. Because <laughs> when your higher power is what people think of you, if you don't like me, I'm screwed. And alcohol isn't taking away it. That's why what happened on January the 15th, which isn't mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, happened on that day. It hadn't happened on any other day. Do you know what it was? I hit bottom. I hit bottom. Another thing that a lot of people are confused about. Most folk have no idea what hitting bottom is. In fact, in our meetings we say things like everybody's bottom's different. Better not be different. There's no, there's no unity in being different. And it's not mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is mentioned in the beautiful 12 and 12. In fact, in the very first step of the 12 and 12 that Bill wrote 12 years later, he says in the very first step, why all this insistence that every alcoholic must Hit bottom first. Now, if you think about that, that's some ballsy crap to say to a bunch of drunks who don't like authoritative figures and being told what to do. Yeah, well, hit bottom on this, Father Mucker. You know. <laughs> but it was so important that Bill insisted that every alcoholic must hit bottom first. Why? Because hitting bottom is the process that brings us back to the power we've abandoned to ask for help. And I didn't even know I'd abandoned the power. ASK, Ask Saving Kit. Help, H-E-L-P, His Ever Loving Presence. And far from everybody's bottom being different, it better be the same. No unity in being different. I ask folk about hitting bottom because it's so imperative. You'd be amazed at what I get told. I ask people all the time, have you hit bottom? They say, yeah, hit bottom. Tell me about it. Tell me about your bottom. One couple just recently. Good little couple. They enjoy being sober. They're part of the fellowship. They're members if they say they are. I asked a little chickadee. I said, have you hit bottom, love? She said, yes. I said, tell me about it. She said, well, it's easy. I was feet to the curb, hustling the Broadway, prostituting myself, trying to earn a dollar so I could get loaded. I said, that wasn't your bottom. She said, well, I think it was. I said, I don't care what you think. <laughs> I said to the dude, what was your bottom, pal? Easy, he said, easy. I know exactly what it was. He said, I was locked up in a penitentiary, married to Bubba. I said, that wasn't your bottom. I said, it felt like it was.
You've got bad minds, I can tell. You've got bad minds. See, hitting bottom, most people think hitting bottom is the outside circumstances and conditions of our life. It's not. Out, hitting bottom is not the, the outside circumstances and conditions of our life, the outside stuff. Hitting bottom's an inside job, not an outside circumstance. And the danger of alcoholics believing that the outside circumstances and conditions of our life is the bottom is that as those outside circumstances get better and improve, we falsely believe we've gotten better and improve and drink again. See it every day. Hitting bottom's an inside job, not an outside circumstance. What happened to me on January the 15th, 1983, happened to you in some capacity or other. I know that as sure as I'm standing here. How do I know that? Because you're here. That's how I know that. You're here, so he must have been there. Like he was for me on January the 15th, 1983. On January the 15th, 1983, hurting so bad, full of hurt and hate, with the gift of desperation, G-O-D, I can remember as clearly as crystal without knowing what I was saying, without knowing who I was saying it to and without knowing what the results of what I was saying was going to be. I can remember going, help me, please help me, what's wrong with me? What am I going to do? Help me, what's wrong with me? And asked for help from outside of myself. And although I'd abandoned him, he hadn't abandoned me. And when I turned back to him and asked for help, he seemed to be looking over my shoulder and he seemed to say to me, Mick, you silly bastard, I've been waiting for you to ask. Now get yourself out of that 12-step fellowship. Sent me to you. I asked for help and he sent me to you. That's why I know that God and the power are different. This power that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous to not have to drink one day at a time is of God and from God and provided by God, but it ain't God. This power in Alcoholics Anonymous that enables an alky to not have to drink one day at a time is of God and from God and provided by God. But it ain't God. There's a lot more to God than the power he provides alkies to not have to drink. That's why in the third step we can turn our will and our life over to the care of that God. I liken it to the money in my pocket. The money in my pocket is of the bank and from the bank and provided by the bank. But it ain't the bank. There's a lot more to the bank than the money in my pocket and there's a lot more to God than the power he provides alkies. This power, this power in rooms like this all over the world. I've spoken on seven continents carry this message. I haven't been to the South Pole, been to the Northern Hemisphere. Been invited down to the NASA, NASA station and it's on the list. But you know what? All over the world, alcoholics do what we're doing here tonight. When two alcoholics come together for the purpose of recovery, God comes in our midst and produces a power greater than either of us. So it's produced by us, but it's greater than us, and we can absolutely depend upon it to not have to drink today. And I saw that in the bigger big book. I saw that in the Bible. I got no problem with the Bible. I quite like the Bible. B-I-B-L-E, being informed before leaving earth. It said... It said in the Bible, when any two are gathered in my name, there I will be in your midst. I went, whoa, that's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. We must have a power right here, right now, enabling upwards of a thousand people to not be drinking on a Friday night in Honolulu, Hawaii. That's what Aloha means, you know that. A-L-O-H-A, a lot of happy alcoholics. There must be a power here, mustn't there? Because if we suffer from a disease that we're powerless over that makes me do what I don't want to do, if I haven't got a counteracting power like the power that's right here, right now, when I go out there, I'll have to drink because the disease will make me drink. Now, I don't know Honolulu very well, but I've got a feeling that it ain't ready for a thousand alkies to go out and get shit-faced tonight. <laughs> So why do we walk around going, powerless, powerless, everybody's powerless, 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 powerless. Poor little powerless, I'm so powerless. My book don't say that. My book says new power has flowed in. 
Why shouldn't we laugh? We've been given the power to help the next guy. Praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry out. Power, power, power. Why am I walking around going powerless? There's an old boy down in San Fernando Valley, 38 years, said he's powerless today as the day he walked in. I said, why did you say that? Because it's true. I said, what did you do about it? He said, I pray to God. I said, make your mind up. What do you mean, he said. I said, well, if you're powerless, you ain't got a God to pray to. If you've got a God to pray to, you ain't powerless. You can't have it both ways. You know what he said? You know what he said? Well, we all know you're weird. <laughs> I said, I may be weird, but I ain't weird enough to listen to your crap, 38 years spewing out a crap out of you. Know that? Anybody remember Father Martin? Lovely man, Father Martin. He said it. I stayed the night with Father Martin and, and I spoke to him about my concept of powerlessness that I've just shared with you. We came forward in his chair and he went, that's exactly right, he said. I went, ooh. <laughs> Two months later, I heard him do a talk. And you know what he said? Same meat, different gravy. He said he went to God and he said, God, what you have all of, I have none of. Can I have some, please? Power. I had a big fat feeling inside. Now this program, we get to apply it to all our affairs, don't we? especially our personal relationships. I've seen a few of you vamping around here today talking about relationships. The R word. Relationships. R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S-H-I-P. Really exciting love affair turns into outrageous nightmare. (laughs) Sobriety hangs in peril. (laughs) <laughs> you're a sick bunch I didn't tell you what hitting bottom means H-I-T-B-O-T-T-O-M hurting inside totally burnt out turn to our master that's what happens when we turn back to the master and ask for help my telephone number incidentally just for the, for the record is 818 area code are you sober are you, like Toys R Us, S-O-B-E-R? 818, not 800, you cheap bastards, 818. <laughs> 818, are you sober? And I love hearing from you. I, I get calls all the time. I love it. I'm more excited today, 28 years later, than I've ever been. I love being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you were to say, here's a thousand dollars, Mick, tell me the last two days in a row you didn't go to a meeting, I wouldn't be able to take your money. I know I get a lot of rah-rah, I get a lot of juice, more, more than I'm entitled to, but I was just referred to as a celebrity. I was referred to as a guru. I went to my, lo- my old home group meeting in San Fernando Valley, a couple of well-known actresses that you know by name there, celebrities. Academy Award winning actresses have come out, known them a long time. They said, oh, hello, Mick, haven't seen you in a while. I said, yeah, good to see you, haven't seen you. They live in Santa Monica, but get to the old home group once in a while. One of them said, I didn't realise, Mick, what a celebrity you've become in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what? She said, you're like this guru guy, everybody knows you, you go speaking everywhere, you know. She said, I'm making a movie in New York, she said, and I went to two meetings in New York, and in both the meetings they quoted you and mentioned you by name. You're like this celebrity. I said, yeah, bloody big deal, a celebrity in an anonymous program. (laughs) Yeah. said, no, you're a celebrity, I'm just a a sober member. And that's very precious to me to be a small part of this great whole. I love being a small part of this great whole. And if you're laughing, you're relating. And if you're relating to a sick bastard like me, there ain't no doubt about you, pal, I'll tell you that. (laughs) This is what Alcoholics Anonymous means to me. Look, A-L-C-O-H-O-L-I-C-S, Alcoholics A-N-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S, Alcoholics Anonymous. A life centred on helping others lives in complete sobriety. Actions, not our names, yield maintenance of unity and service. That's good shit, isn't it? I'm going to wind up by reading my favourite passage. 
page 386 of the fourth edition. I looked up an AA meeting and went there alone. I did that. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in any other effort I'd made to save myself. Here was power. Here was power to live to the end of any given day, power to have the courage to face the next day, power to have friends, power to help people, power to be sane, power to stay sober. That was seven years ago and many AA meetings ago. And I haven't had a drink during those seven years.